Science was in the air when progressivism was born in this country. Edison, Marconi, Ford, the Wright brothers, all the rest. Woodrow Wilson was not only first and so far, luck has held our last PhD uh, <clears throat> as president. He was an early president of the American Political Science Association. And he believed, as progressives did, that the secret to good government would be to concentrate more and more power in Washington, more and more Washington power in the executive branch, and more and more executive branch power in experts and expert commissions often insulated from political control. These would be called today, we call them czars. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, Woodrow Wilson's boon companion and closest advisor, Colonel House, actually wrote a novel called Philip Drew Administrator. And it's about a, a heroic rebellion against uh, congressional government and the installation of a group of five administrators who have reduced politics to the administration of things, and the country lived happily ever after, according to that. Well, th this was their goal. The goal was to make the constitutional restraints infinitely elastic on the government, to construe the living constitution in a way that the federal government had whatever powers were necessary for whatever goals it set itself. Now, the problem with this is, is obvious, that a constitution that is living and growing in this way in no meaningful sense constitutes, but that's just fine. The problem with this is when you get a modern government as busy as ours is, a modern government in which there's really almost nothing that isn't the business of the government, Congress is much too busy to legislate in any meaningful sense. What Congress passes these days hardly count as laws. They're more suggestions or intimations or affirmations of sentiments that are then passed on to the executive branch and the rulemaking process, which turns them actually into law. John Locke said, and he turns out to have been wrong, that legislators can make laws they can't make other legislators. In fact, what the Congress does with its lawmaking today is turn the executive branch into the real lawmaking institution of the government. And if we're going to restore the rule of law, it seems to me conservatism has to go back and learn from some early colleagues of Bill Buckley, such as Jim Burnham, who wrote an, a, a long book called Congress in the American Tradition which asserted basically this, that our nation was born in reaction against an overbearing executive, the British crown, and conservatism in its modern form, which was born in reaction against the executive aggrandizement of the New Deal. And conservatism, and indeed I think, as I'm suggesting, the rule of law depends on A, a limited government that does rather less so that Congress can, in a meaningful sense, legislate and write laws for it, but also a, a government uh, that, again, locates the lawmaking in the responsible and accountable law uh, legislature. The problem is that we have now, in the process of producing the government that, cons that progressives have wanted, we've produced a presidency that is a kind of watery Caesarism, a cult of the presidency indeed. And this is, again, because all the barriers to the expansion of the political pre purview have now gone down. The late James Q. Wilson, who died uh, last year, probably the most distinguished political scientist of, of my lifetime, once put it this way, our politics once was about only a few things. Today, it is about nearly everything. Until rather recently, the chief issue in any congressional argument over new policies was whether it was legitimate for the federal government to do something at all. That was the crux of the dispute over Social Security, welfare, Medicare, civil rights, selective service, foreign aid, international alliances, price and wage controls, economic regulations. Once, however, the legitimacy barrier was fallen, New programs need not wait the advent of a crisis or an extraordinary majority because no process and no program is any longer new. It is seen rather as an extension, a modification, or an enlargement of something the government is already doing. 
Well, this is the way we live now. Reasserting congressional supremacy simply begins by noting that Congress is constitutionally the first branch of government. It is Article I. I don't know if you've ever been to the rotunda of the archives and seen the Constitution on parchment underneath four panes of glass. Uh, two of the panes cover the first branch of government because it is uh, most of what the Constitution talks about is that. Instead, what we have today is almost entirely a presidential system. The grotesque and swollen nature of the office, and I'm not simply complaining about the current occupant, uh, under, uh, under all both parties is by now to some of us with small r Republican sentiments simply grotesque. And this has to do with the coming of a theory that intersected with a new technology, broadcasting, movies, and all the rest. The theory was that, uh, Woodrow Wilson's theory, that the country needed a strong, charismatic president to interpret the country to itself, to make articulate its incohate aspirations, yearnings, and desires. This was the coming of what has been called by a political scientist named Jeffrey Tulis, University of Texas, the rhetorical presidency. We tend to forget, because presidents are in our living room constantly on television and are forever talking, not least the current one, how what a recent phenomenon this is in American history. The average number of speeches given for public consumption by George Washington was three. John Adams gave one a year. On average, Thomas Jefferson, five. James Madison, none, not one. Lincoln at Gettysburg, as you probably know, was not the featured speaker. He was there as a warm-up act for a man named Edward Everett. Lincoln spoke for about two minutes and 50 seconds, something like that. Most people in that age before electronic sound didn't realize he was speaking before he'd already sat down and completed. Andrew Johnson, poor devil, was impeached for his presidential rhetoric. The man who succeeded Lincoln was uh, uh, a, a man who, who was one of the articles of impeachment was the improper use of presidential rhetoric. Presidents Hayes, Harrison, and McKinley gave 500 speeches, but that was because they went on tours. And during the tours, they would say things like, Harrison said, public affairs is in some measure prohibited to me. They were simply not allowed to talk about them. Uh, McKinley, in all of his public speeches, never made any mention of the Spanish-American War, the coming of Jim Crow to the South, or the war in the Philippines. Now, this was all to change with that great agent of change, Teddy Roosevelt, who was properly called a steam shovel in trousers. He was an, just a volcanic man of, of vast energies. He was the first person to be president ever filmed by a movie camera. He was actually filmed by it before he became president. He was the first president to actually engage in popular rhetoric, that is, rhetoric designed to have a mass appeal. Until Teddy Roosevelt, almost all presidential rhetoric was A, written, and B, sent to the Congress. It was intergovernmental communication. He was the first man to have uh, presidential rhetoric intended to have mass effects, routine, direct appeals to the people something the founders never contemplated and I'm sure would have been horrified. This is what we count as leadership today. The word leader or leadership, the word leader actually and leaders, appears 13 times in the Federalist Papers. Once as a reference to the leaders of the revolution and 12 times as a term of disparagement. They thought that the point of leadership was not to arouse but to dampen public enthusiasm and public opinion. But Teddy Roosevelt changed this in 1906 when he went out campaigning to pass the Hepburn Act, now lost to historical memory. It was not a regime-level issue. It was about railroad regulation. 
but it became a transformative moment in our constitutional history, really, when the president began to be a rouser of and shaper of and leader of public opinion. Hitherto, the idea of leadership was to act as a break upon public opinion. Teddy Roosevelt did not want to rein it in. He wanted to spur the stallion of public opinion. And while he was doing this, the president of Princeton University was watching and taking notes and deciding that that was indeed the way to go. The railroad was coming. It would move candidates around the country. The telegraph was coming, and soon the radio, eventually the airplane. And we began to simply erase the distinction between campaigning and governing. We simply overthrew what had been a kind of common law of political rhetoric in our country. Again, there was a technology involved, railroads eventually, radio and airplanes and television and all the rest, plus an ideology. And the ideology was the progressives, one expressed by Woodrow Wilson, who said this about the presidency. A nation is led by a man who speaks a new principle for a new age, a man in whose ears the voices of the nation sound like the united voices of a chorus, whose many meanings spoken by melodious tongues unite in his understanding in a single meaning and reveal to him a single version so that he can speak what no man else knows, the common meaning of the common voice. Now, this is giving a quite heroic role to the presidency, the interpreter, as I say, of the incohate yearnings of an inarticulate, half-attentive American public. Television, of course, was to cap this entirely. But what Woodrow Wilson was giving there was a theory for Teddy Roosevelt's practice that we were going to do from now on, and we were going to have a government united as the nation is because we needed it united as a necessity to govern in our complicated 20th century. Combine this theory of presidential leadership with the new fact of bureaucracy, and you could begin to see how you could apply the progressive dream of expertise concentrated in Washington uh, sold to the country by an articulate and loquacious chief executive. Again, as I say, science was in the air, and this was particularly true of the science of politics, as it was then believed in. Woodrow Wilson, great believer in, in being able to subdue all things to codified rationality, actually wrote a constitution for his marriage to Mrs. Res uh, Wilson. He said, and I quote, after we write a constitution for our marriage, this was when they were courting, if you can imagine it, he says, then we can make bylaws at our leisure as they become necessary. I dare say that's the progressive spirit applied to everyday life. Again, he was, his complaint with the founders was not marginal and not peripheral. His complaint was with the checks and balances, the separation of powers, and with federalism. Now, the man who would take the next step beyond Woodrow Wilson was the man who served as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt's distant cousin, Franklin. Everyone remembers, of course, his famous inaugural, what, 70, 80 years ago, on March 4th, 1933, in which he said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Better to read the tail end of his first inaugural address, where he urges the country to move as a trained and loyal army, submitting, he said, our lives and property to a common discipline with a unity of duty hitherto evoked only in times of armed strife. The martial metaphor was beginning to be born. We've now had wars on drugs and wars on poverty and wars on energy shortage, wars all the time. Presidents love wars and war metaphors because, as Randolph Bourne once said, war is the health of the state. War is, as Madison said, the chief driver of executive aggrandizement.